Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Rana Saab, and uh, welcome everyone. Uh, and uh, we have uh, those who are in Holland they know that we have stormy weather and we have uh, strong winds. So best day to have this uh, webinar and online dialogue. Uh, as, as Amir said, this is our topic today. It's every, if everyone can see my screen. And as da 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 da, why? Okay. Yeah, it's okay, sir. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Now, I will, as, as uh, Amir Rana said, I will have a really very brief introduction uh, of uh, OPP, uh, Overseas Progressive Pakistanis, and then we will move on to the topic. Uh, just uh, in five, six bullet points, our story, OPP now is about four years young. I'm not calling it four years old for obvious reasons. <laughs> and uh, I think the important point is that we have no affiliation with any political or any other party whatsoever, which means we, we don't get uh, any kind of support from any party, whether financial or otherwise or political. We fully rely on you people who are our supporters and who are uh, in this program today and many of you who will watch probably later. Uh, we are a very flat and very democratic organization. So our structure, we don't have presidents and so on and so forth. We always hold, we just held our fourth annual review and planning meeting, which is a very open and transparent meeting with all our supporters invited to that meeting. And at that meeting, we always uh, present the review of the uh, previous year and we plan together with them uh, the year ahead. Uh, we do dialogues like today on the on the real issues, uh, not not just fake issues to kill time, and uh, uh, not just uh, gossiping or, uh, uh, or or purely social programs. We are Holland based, but uh, this COVID has had some positive news for us that our outreach has uh, geographically spread quite a bit. All our details about the about the organization are on our website and please feel free to visit it at, at your convenience and go through it. Uh, why the screen is not moving further? Uh, sir, can, can you please uh, uh, use this one? This button? Yeah. No, it's okay. Yeah. yeah. All right. I'll yeah. use it. So very quickly, the purpose of this organization, reason for being, OPP is a platform for the people of Pakistani origin. All are welcome to promote progressive values in a multicultural environment. Our vision is unity in diversity. Our mission statement says we strive to eliminate exploitation and discrimination through meaningful dialogues like one today. Uh, our orientations, uh, political inclination is we believe in democracy, human rights, minority rights, and gender equality. On religious front, we strongly believe in the separation of uh, state and religion. And socially, we believe in integration, tolerance, uh, acceptance, and harmony. Uh, back to today's topic. So that was really the, a very, very quick introduction. Uh, I will just want to remind most of you probably attended or some of you attended our previous COVID program, a dialogue a webinar we had on 9th of May last year. And at that meeting, we had two speakers. Uh, you can see their pictures uh, on the left is uh, Shamsi Saab and on the right, uh, we have Naim Arif Saab. I think they both are listening. Uh, they were our key speakers and we actually focused on the social and economic impact. At that time, I was just uh, like to uh, remind ourselves what we said in summary, and this is just a copy paste from one of the previous charts. And this, this is kind of analysis we did at that time. We said that there will be widening gaps between rich and poor, between natives and immigrants. We talked a lot about it and we are seeing that happening. We talked about huge bailouts will happen. At the same time, there will be no access of clean water or soap for 3 billion people to wash their hands even during COVID period. Uh, we mentioned that healthcare will and free market will have a huge conflict because the privatization uh, boom will start and there will be a, a conflict between collectiveness and neoliberalism. We also talked about or predicted the civil liberties versus uh, surveillance that uh, we will civil liberties will be lost and the surveillance will increase. We talked about the risks to democracy and we see that happening. 
And we also said that there will be rise in polarization and right-wing extremism, and there will be growth in digital business, medicine, education, et cetera. Privacy will come under threat, and the governments are going to come back in a bigger way because there was a tendency of having smaller governments, but they will make a, the bigger government will make a comeback. So this was uh, uh, what my have it now this this we just made this collage because uh, as they say a picture tells uh, a thousand words and and if we see what has been happening during last 12 15 months we have had the heads of the states who were making fun of corona and they were not taking it seriously we had people looking for their dead ones uh, in the hospitals on the streets uh, in, in 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 the graveyards and we had uh, seen people five persons or uh, five coffins in, in one grave, mass uh, graves in, in, in a way. We have seen people singing on their balconies, singing opera, trying to communicate with each other and show solidarity, solidarity with each other. Uh, all this was happening. And we also saw thousands and thousands of jobless workers who were walking back to their villages where they came from. And, uh, and while this was happening, we were also seeing unprecedented growth in the wealth of the billion the billionaires in this world. So this has been a very, very contradictory development that on one side, we had a lot of misery and on, other, uh, on the other hand, we had a lot of uh, wealth generation. Uh, Naomi Klein, you, I'm sure you all are, or most of you are aware of her. She said, in moments of crisis, people are willing to hand over a great deal of power to anyone who claims to have a magic cure, whether the crisis is a financial meltdown or as the Bush administration would later show a terrorist attack. So this is quote, and what she, what Naomi, I'll come back to that later. She calls it disaster capitalism. And, uh, and that has been a very interesting phenomena because I would highly recommend you people who are interested to read uh, Naomi Klein because she describes in detail and with research and case studies how post-disaster settings uh, have paved the way for neoliberal agendas which brought privatizations, market deregulations, and deconstruction of social services. So she calls it the shock doctrine. So you give people a shock, make them disoriented, and then impose the changes. So you make uh, a living out of disaster, out of a disaster, and she called it disaster uh, capitalism or shock doctrine. Uh, just her contrary, her counterpart, Milton Friedman, and I'm sure you people are aware because he was one of the biggest gurus of neoliberalism. He said only a crisis actual or perceived, doesn't have to be a real, it could be a perceived uh, crisis, produces real change. And he has been the man who has been saying that whenever there is a disaster or there is a crisis, you have a big opportunity to implement your plans you always wanted to, imp uh, wanted to implement. So he doesn't want to let any, any opportunity or any disaster pass away without making, making a bug out of it. Uh, now, coming to our disasters, I will just uh, do a very general picture of disasters, what disaster capitalism actually is. And we see that, that this predatory or disaster capitalism has become much, much more visible during this uh, corona pandemic more than ever before. Uh, we see exploitation and the shock, exploitation of the shock and trauma of disasters, because this, this whole thing, disaster capitalism, actually their philosophy is to exploit the people when they are in shock and when they are in trauma because of any disaster. And, and this, there is a long history. It is not just this pandem pandemic. I mean, if we look at Katrina, which happened in the USA, we look at the tsunami, the big tsunami we had, we had several wars, uh, we, have, we had several pandemics. And if you, if you look at these, uh, 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 these, these uh, examples I am giving in, in Katrina, just to give you just, very brief examples. Before Katrina, there were about 123 uh, public schools in that area, low cost or free schools. And there was always a battle against those uh, to privatize those uh, and those schools. And as soon as Katrina happened, the bingo, they made the use of that disaster. And now there are four schools left out of those uh, 123. Uh, the teachers who had very strong union that was completely 
uh, finished. All the teachers was fired who were part of the union. The school board was disbanded. And same thing happened with tsunami in Sri Lanka. The all, they always had the plans to clean up the, the villages of the poor people near the beaches and to turn those areas into very high end uh, kind of tourist uh, resorts. And tsunami came, those, uh, those villages were wiped out and what happened? Yeah, it's your guess. Wars, we can see what has been happening. Uh, just take uh, Iraq war, for example, the first Iraq war, we had seen 100,000 civilian contractors uh, in Iraq and more than $2 billion worth contracts were given to, to the private companies. So whole war has been privatized in a way. And most of the contracts, they went to Halliburton and, and, and Blackwater. Uh, and you know, the Guantanamo Bay, Guantanamo Bay and the black sites and so on and so forth. And the same thing is happening. So it is a tradition. It's a pattern. You see that happening. And as a result, there is always a massive private privatization and there is a massive outsourcing. I mean, the examples I gave you as a result of those, we have seen even detention centers privatized, torture privatized, prisons privatized, military consultants becoming a big and profitable business, as I said. So if we see as a result of these measures, the, the corporations, they have over time much, much more powerful than the governments ever would be. And so again, Naomi Klein, she says a state of shock is something that happens to us, not only when something bad happens, it's what happens when we lose our narrative, when we lose our story, when we become dis disoriented. So this is the whole trick. Uh, you see the picture, and I think I flew over Cuckoo's Nest, if you have seen that movie, otherwise uh, do watch that. So you have to first disorient a person and then you can impose any change, any solution you want. Uh, coming to COVID now, this, this uh, ending this pattern or bringing it to the, towards COVID, everyone agrees that this COVID-19 has been the biggest economic crisis since the Great Depression. Uh, I mean, the biggest disaster, economic disaster ever happened since the Great Depression. It has created a lot of discrimination, a lot of stress among masses, depression, domestic violence, you name it. While this is happening, Alliance called this 2020 year of the rich. Why? Because it, only in the US, the billionaires, they saw increase in their wealth by 1.1 billion, which is 1,100 billion. And the world's richest 1% now own 162 trillion, which is 45% of the total wealth worldwide. Now, and the, and the corona hits uh, stimulus packages for, of tens and thousands of trillions to multinational companies. I mean, this all is happening while we are talking about great stress, uh, biggest depression since the, since the, uh, the, since the great uh, depression. Uh, then there's estimate of several estimates that uh, about 207 million people, they will be uh, entering uh, the, the extreme poverty. Now, interesting thing is, it is not just any poverty, extreme poverty, because according to, to uh, what is that uh, NGO, anyway, I forgot the name, but uh, that some 400 million people will be entering Oxen. poverty. Oxen, yeah, thank you. They, uh, that they will be entering poverty. And that definition yeah. of over 400 million people entering poverty is the, is the people who live on four, four and a half dollars per day. But this 207 million extra entering extreme poverty are the people who uh, will be living on one and a half dollar a day. So then we see on the vaccine side, while this is happening, on the vaccine side, the testing has been done in poor countries. The distribution is being done to the rich countries who are hoarding. And the, the profit margins of the companies, which have been funded by the governments, by the way, because uh, 2 billion was only given by, by European Union to develop the vaccines, but they have profit mar margins of somewhere between uh, 70 to 80%. So this is how these people are, uh, are operating. Uh, and if you see again on the discrimination side, uh, Republic of South Africa, they got there last week, I think the first 1 million doses with a population of 60 million. 
and only 5.54% of the black Americans are receiving uh, vaccines while their population is, I think, somewhere between 14 and 16%. So, and according to the World Bank, uh, poor and vulnerable will be most harmed by this COVID. There will be sharp increase in of 120 million extra into extreme poverty. The migrants' remittances to their home countries will shrink, which will create other problems in their home countries. The families will have to make trade-offs because they don't have the disposable income to spend on health and education, so they will suffer. And the poor countries, the war zones, uh, the occupied territories like Palestine the, uh, or Yemen, uh, refugees, etc., they will be always the last in the queue to receive any kind of help of, or any kind of vaccination. I will skip this chart uh, because it's too detailed. Uh, yeah, this, this one is uh, just a good example of holding that uh, on the right, United States is about 14% of world's population. Uh, uh, sorry, they are 4.25% 4 uh, of world population and they are getting about 14% vaccine. European Union is about 9.78% uh, of population and they are getting about 22%. And on the top of the list is Canada. They are 0.5% population uh, of the world population and they are getting 330 million. It's a population of 38 million people and they are getting 330 million vaccines, which mean 10 vaccines per person. 10 vaccines per person they are holding. And in Africa, they are getting one vaccine per 10 person, persons. So this is the kind of uh, uh, discrepancy we are talking about. On this graph, you can see that the nations which, uh, which, which form 14% of the world's population, they are buying 53% of the production. So this is what we are saying. Is This has become so bad that the, the head of uh, World Health Organization, he said uh, a, a week ago or so, I need to be blunt. The world is on the brink of a catastrophic moral failure. And the price of this failure will be paid with lives and livelihoods in the world's poorest countries. And this is what the head of uh, WHO is saying. Uh, but I mean, we all know that in neoliberalism and in capitalism, there is uh, the, the word uh, moral failure or moral doesn't exist. There are no ethics because as uh, Milton Friedman said, the, the companies or the businesses exist only to make money. It's not our job to, to help anyone. This has become again so bad that this ex-footballer, you might recognize him, he said when the testing was being done of vaccines, the initial testing in Brazil and in Africa, who are, who are not getting those vaccines, but they were good enough to be tested there. He said, do not take African people as human guinea pigs. It's absolutely disgusting. So this is how. The conflicts and risks emerging, I'm coming to the closing, is, 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 which are coming up. And again, this is happening and will happen more and more that we will see right-wing extremism, even with Trump gone, it will rise protectionism will rise, trade wars will emerge, and the protest uh, at lower level, grassroots level will also increase. Uh, UNODC, they have said that entry of substandard and falsified vaccines, theft of vaccines within the distribution systems, leakages in emergency funding, favoritism, nepotism, and corrupted procurement systems. So these, these are, and as an example, uh, out of the 41 million, this is figure of last week, vaccines doses which were handed to United States, fewer than 22 million have been administered. And can you imagine that about 19 million just, uh, sort of just disappeared? Uh, nobody knows where they are. Uh, second point in Pakistan, uh, we got last week a gift of half a million doses, I mean, you know, 220 million plus population. These doses have been delivered and there have been reports now openly in the newspaper that if you go to a hospital for a treatment or for a bed for Corona, they ask you to pay cash upfront uh, this much money, 500,000 rupees. And they are testing scams, the, the uh, fake certificates of tests being issued. And this is, by the way, not only Pakistan, it's in happening, happening in many, many countries and, and medicine background. Uh, so this is, uh, we see this, this, this happening uh, in Pakistan. Okay, now, sorry. 
I will now introduce uh, our distinguished uh, speaker of today. I mean, that's really our main main event today, and that's uh, Dr. Kesar Bangali. Uh, we're very grateful, very thankful to ha have him. Whatever I said just now, I'm sure he's going to put this in the context of Pakistan, the context of Pakistani economic. So we, it will help us to understand the overall picture of the economic evolution, economic development, the situation where we are coming from, how does uh, this, this COVID thing fit into it, and uh, what is the way forward. So our speaker today, uh, Again, it's it's always a problem because we have such wonderful speakers and they 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 have such a rich 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 background that it's very difficult to to do justice to them when we introduce them. So, Dr. Dr. Kesar Bangali, he's a well-known economist uh, with 45 years of experience in teaching, research, and policy advice in Pakistan. His areas of research include issues in planning and development and macroeconomic and fiscal policies, particularly relating to interpersonal and interregional inequality, poverty and employment, and social justice, urban and regional planning, decentralization and local government, and finance, education, and ethnic sectarian and religious military violence. Then it goes on. His international teaching and research consultancy experience, it includes uh, Geneva, it includes uh, Sussex in the UK, uh, other international organizations in Afghanistan, Saudi Arabia, Eritrea, and, and Kenya. He has over 35 research publications in national and international journals and conferences, and he's author and editor of eight books on subjects ranging from unemployment, inequality, and poverty uh, to education, water, gender, and uh, regional development. So Dr. Kaiser Bangali, thank you very much for accepting our invitation uh, for talking to us today. And uh, please welcome Dr. Kaiser Bangali. Rana, sir? You, I'm, I'm going to stop screen share and Rana Saab, can you put up Dr. Saab's presentation? Yes, Hello? I'm going to, yeah, I'm going to put uh, Dr. Saab's presentation. Okay, thank you. Dr. Saab, can you, can you see that? Hey, uh, I can see yeah. that. And uh, yeah, I request all of you to please mute yourself so that uh, Dr. Sab can talk. Assalamu alaikum, everybody. Uh, particularly to the comrades of the overseas progressive Pakistanis. Uh, thank you for this initiative. Uh, not just today's uh, webinar, but the initiative to form this forum and to promote uh, progressive causes through dialogue. I think that's a great uh, uh, initiative. Uh, on coming to today's presentation, I think uh, Vahid Patizab has given a very excellent overview of what has been happening, uh, not just with COVID, but with every disaster and how the, there is a section of the people population that takes advantage of that disaster and feeds on the miseries of the poor. Uh, but uh, I will speak with the context of Pakistan and uh, can I have the next please? Uh, yes, sir. Yeah, we, I, I will, my presentation is in two parts. One, I will state the context, the background to Pakistan's political economy. Uh, and then I will come to directly to the COVID and its impact and what we need to do to address uh, this crisis from a people's perspective. Uh, next, please. So the background to Pakistan's economy, uh, there are we can divide Pakistan into two stages, Pakistan's economic history. The first stage is 30 year period from 47 to 77. And Pakistan was a development state. The character of the state was that of a development state. 
all governments during this 30 year period, whether it was civilian, military, capitalist, socialist, they pursued economic development and created a huge stock of economic assets. We have built dams, canals, power stations, ports, highways, heavy industries uh, that were built during these 30 years. You know, Pakistan, when Pakistan was created, became independent in 47, had virtually no infrastructure. And there were only six medium-sized in factories in the whole of West Pakistan. Uh, but this 30-year period saw a complete transformation. In fact, it changed the economic geography of the country. Uh, where not a blade of grass grew, we now have two crops a year, where there were sandy, dusty landscapes. <clears throat> we have uh, bustling towns uh, in, 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 the, in the Indus uh, Basin. So this, this was a golden period of Pakistan's economic history, irrespective of the kind of government we had. 1977 heralded the second stage of Pakistan economic history and essentially economy died and we became a security state. Uh, during the military regime periods, we have seen, especially General Zia and General Musharraf's period, the infrastructure development was no longer on the agenda. And we can hardly see any meaningful projects that happened during that time. But uh, non-development government's infra, uh, expenditure kept increasing and massive debt was incurred uh, foreign, from foreign sources as well as domestic sources. Uh, we have had civilian governments in between, uh, military governments, and they have attempted to pursue a development agenda. Uh, both the People's Party government and the PMLN government uh, did attempt some uh, development schemes, uh, but uh, their major constraint was the debt service burden that had to be the debt. For example, the debt incurred by the Zia regime had to be paid during the 90s by the PPP and PMLN government. And there was very little left for any development work. Next, please. Next, please. Now, the, the evidence of what I'm saying, by the way, whatever statements I'm making, there is empirical evidence behind it. They are there in the research publications of my own and my colleagues and other, other colleagues of ours in Pakistan. So if you look at the national budgets, we can see two diversion paths during phase one and phase two. Phase one is the development state period up to 1977 and phase two is after 1977. During 72 to 76, the growth rate of development expenditure in real terms, meaning taking away the inflation part was 21% per annum. Uh, this kind of growth rate uh, uh, has, is seldom seen uh, in, in the world. 77, to 1988, which is General Zia's period, the growth rate of development expenditure fell to 2.7%. So this is the evidence that 77 was a watershed year in Pakistan's history where the development state just died and the objective of the state, whichever government, the military governments that came into power was anything but development. A lack of investment in infrastructure, when you have development expenditure crashing from 21% to 2.5%, so obviously economic infrastructure is not being built and existing infrastructure is not being maintained. So what has happened is that the productive capacity of the economy has seriously eroded. And we are now stuck with a low GDP growth rate. Uh, we have had GDP growth rate even um, 0%. Uh, or 1% or 2% in the last 20, 20, 25 years. So the economy was already on its knees even before COVID happened and COVID has just uh, made things worse. Uh, our export is stuck between 22 and 24 billion for the last five, six years. It's, it's not growing. In fact, we, I must say that for, for many years in the, up to the, in the 60s and even the 70s, we used to taunt India 
that it has a Hindu rate of growth. Uh, it is now India which is galloping forward and we have the Hindu rate of growth. Uh, this has not happened accidentally. Uh, we will go into the reasons of why Pakistan has been stuck into this low growth, low export trap. Uh, while GDP growth rate is, is stuck in the low single digit, uh, non-development expenditure and defense expenditure has continued to grow. During the period 72 to 76, military expenditure growth was 2% per annum. 77 to 88, military expenditure growth was 9% per annum. So this is the kind of change that has taken place between phase one and phase two. Now, today, we have to take loans to survive, but new loans are taken just to repay past loans. And the development agenda has ground to zero. When you have, don't have development agenda, when you don't have development projects, you don't create opportunities for jobs. So unemployment and poverty is now staring us in the face. Mass unemployment and mass poverty. So today, Basically, for the last 20 years, especially 2000 onward, the, since General Musharraf regime took over, uh, wealth is not generated from production of goods and commodity producing sectors, which is agriculture and industry. Both these sectors are stagnating, agriculture as well as industry. Wealth is now being produced from speculation in stock market, property market, and commodity trading. We have become a casino economy where a handful of families speculate on these markets, the stock market, the property market, or the commodity market, and make overnight they become millionaires. But, but this does not create jobs and does not produce goods, so it does not have the exportable surplus, and that is why our exports are stuck, uh, stagnant at between 22 to 24 billion. Uh, at the same time, while exports are stagnant, uh, the window for import has been thrown wide open. And Pakistan has been turned into a market for foreign companies. Effective control of the economy since the 2000s is directly with agents of foreign interest. You know, Shokat Aziz and uh, both the prime minister, the finance minister, chair, uh, heads of the state bank are now appointees of uh, Internet Western creditor organization. Uh, they are not representatives of our people. Uh, next, please. Uh, so this is the state of the economy we are in. Manuf agriculture and manufacturing, which is where goods are produced for domestic consumption as well as for exports are stagnant. Imports have ballooned and you can get everything now. So you go to a supermarket in Karachi, Lahore, Islamabad, and it is, you have to search for Pakistani things. Even cat food and dog food and cat shampoo and dog shampoo is imported and available in supermarkets. So this is the state of the economy we have driven ourselves to. Before I move on to COVID, I want to dispel two myths, mega myths that have been floating around that has been provided it has, it has been repeated so many times that all, everybody now believes that to be true, but it is, it is false. The first is that it is the private sector that carried out Pakistan's early industrialization. And they cite the 1960s and Ayub Khan's regime during that period. What is not mentioned is that throughout the 50s and the 60s, Pakistan's industrialization was carried out by the public sector not the private sector. It was PIDC which would set up industries, run them for three to four years, make it commercially operational, and then sell it to the private sector. That is how the private sector would come in. The private sector, sell, there are seldom industries which were initiated by the private sector with their capital and their management. So it was public sector which industrialized Pakistan in the first 20 years of our life, of our country's life. This was the basis of industrialization in the 50s and 60s. Next, please. The second myth is that nationalization seriously damaged Pakistan's industry. 
you know, it's now 40 years since or half a century since nationalization. And even now when governments can't produce good results, they, they say nationalization damaged our economy, so we can't recover. If after half an hour you can't recover, something must be seriously wrong. But in any case, this itself is so false that nationalization damaged Pakistan's economy. And I invite you all, whoever can, can go over Pakistan's data. Not a lot of, you don't have to search a lot. Just go to the Pakistan Economic Survey, which is produced annually by the finance ministry. It is, it is been produced every year without fail. The data is available. The focus of economic activity merely shifted from the private to the public domain. There was no dip, there was no drop in. In fact, 72, 73 is one year after the war and we lost East Pakistan, the country broke up and production, uh, industrial production goes up in 72, 73, exports go up, revenue goes up. Now. So you can't say that nationalization damaged the economy. Uh, it, all the production statistics continued uh, to be good, except that all the, the economy was functioning the shift in the public sector, more in the public sector rather than the private sector. So both these myths have to be dispelled. Pakistan's industrialization was initiated by the public sector and nationalization did not damage Pakistan's economy. In fact, it helped, as my next slide will show. Now, uh, all along, even, even, even something like 35, 30, 40 years ago, one question kept coming in my mind is, Pakistan lost the war in 71, the country was devastated, we broke our, our major source of foreign exchange was gone. Our major rice market was gone. Uh, all our wiring was disrupted. The economy should have suffered. It should have collapsed. It didn't. In fact, one year after we began to pick up uh, almost every sector. How, how can that happen? And my conclusion is that it is nationalization which saved us. In the aftermath of the war, with all the, all the disruption that had taken place, the economic disruption, the private sector, the 22 families which owned, uh, which had a very large monopoly of ownership of industries and banks and they would have just taken their capital and fled the country because there would have been so much uncertainty and the economy would have collapsed. But nationalization made sure that not a rupee left the country. In fact, so nationalization saved the economy and helped it to grow. And during the 70s, the government built mega projects, steel mill, electrical and mechanical complexes, Port Qasim, Indus Highway, Mangla Dam. These, these are mega projects which, which sustain the economy then and continues to sustain the economy today. Next, please. <clears throat> I, I, now, I now come to the issues with COVID, which is the subject of today's webinar. Uh, what COVID has done, uh, two things. It has exposed the inability of the capitalist state to address the basic needs of the people. In fact, in Pakistan, we have seen the government wanted to deliver aid, but didn't know where to deliver it. We didn't know where the people were. For example, they, they gave uh, support to industries to make sure that they would keep paying salaries to their workers. But in Pakistan, workers, employers don't register their workers. They are no longer uh, on the rolls. They no longer get employ uh, uh, appointment letters. So who, who are the workers? Where are the workers? If the government gives a million uh, rupees to an industry and a million is just a token, their sums have been much larger for distribution of salaries to its workers. What, where are the workers? How is, can they ensure that the workers are being paid? The, there are vast, there's a vast population about which, which, for which the government has no record. 
they they don't exist officially so the capitalist state could not really help these people but it also the capitalist state could not sustain its own economy the 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 the, uh, the companies and the corporations appealed and begged in, before the government for for bailouts to be to be able to continue and this has not just happened in pakistan it has happened the world over so what kind of a neoliberal capitalist uh, model we have that it can't sustain any shocks every time there's a shock and this is not just the covid is not the only shock where they have appealed for bailouts every time there's a shock to the economy uh, they 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 appeal to the government to the state for bailouts the uh, the problem is that the reason the market cannot address the needs of the people is because the market responds only to purchasing power which the rich have and they do not respond to need which is that of the poor so we we if covid has given us an opportunity covid has exposed the hollowness and the bankruptcy of the neoliberal capitalist state and it has given us an opportunity to demand that the economy be reengineered the first thing that we need to do is abandon export led growth next please <clears throat> Uh, what is the what is the economy look like today agriculture is dominated by cash crops cotton and sugarcane manufacturing is thing is dominated by textiles exports dominated by textiles two two thirds of our exports for the last 50 years has been textiles we have not diversified anywhere else imports are dominated by per oil products petroleum and oil Uh, about 25% of our import is just one commodity which is oil revenues are dominated by general sales tax which comes from largely from textiles so we are a, we are a very narrowly based economy and we have heard the term banana republic but pakistan is a cotton republic it is cotton that drives everything cotton as a raw material drives textile which drives exports which drives revenues in all this scenario the economy is not geared to serve the needs of the people we we have gst which is an indirect tax which actually puts the burden of taxation on the poor rather than the rich uh, so and and basic items of use by the people uh, are not being produced because the entire stress is production for export we we were we we had a situation some time back where the federal government wanted to outsource pakistan's entire coastline to one multinational fishing company that of course would have driven out all the local fishermen from the coast and the argument they presented was that uh, this is a very valuable source of foreign exchange and it will save our balance of payments problem of course it would maybe save up the balance of payments problem but it would have devastated the livelihoods of millions of uh, poor fishermen and all the families associated with the fishing industry uh, on the coast so this this has been the nature of our economy uh, and the and the hollowness of this economy has been exposed next please now we cannot can no longer afford to run an export led growth because if you want to export there must be a market for export there have to be buyers for your products that you are trying to export but that market is shrinking there is a recession in north america and europe which means our exports will decline and 50% of our exports go to uh, north america and europe uh, if there is a recession in the middle east means our remittances will decline so essentially we will our foreign exchange inflows will drop and that means higher trade deficit and a higher balance of payments deficit that we have to live with now export decline means a decline in the textile industry which will suffer slowdowns or shutdowns even uh, and a slowdown means lower demand for cotton which means agriculture is producing cotton will not have a buyer in the textile industry which means more unemployment in agriculture as well as in industry 
and when the industrial slowdown or shutdown happens government's revenue collection will also decline so we have higher budget deficit so we have higher trade deficit higher balance of payment deficit higher budget deficit and higher unemployment this is what we are facing today as we speak next please <clears throat> what now that was the impact on the economy that i talked about what is the impact on the rich and the poor that uh, the introduction was referring to uh, for the poor it has impacted drastically several companies have thrown out their workers organizations even 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 ngos have closed down uh, the research organizations in the in non government sector has closed down people have been unemployed those who are making even 100000 rupees a month are now they 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 don't have money to for for food in their house you know those, those who are that's the state today and it is not just the poor who have suffered even the middle class has suffered uh, as i said those who are earning 100000 rupees a month don't have money for food today retail, individual retail shop owners don't have customers uh, there are there are shop owners who were whose shop were on rent can't pay pay rent so they have had to shut down their shop and there is no food in their home homes to because they have no income anymore so those who are employed have are suffering and those who are self employed are also suffering so this this is unemployment and lack of income is across the board but it has brought windfall gains to some pharmaceutical companies of course are making money because with all the sickness around uh, people are buying medicines uh, antibiotics steroids and of course now vaccine producers are are going to be some of the richest companies and people in the world private hospitals are making money uh, you know it is it is it is it is painful to find that there are private hospitals in pakistan who are charging between 75000 rupees to 125000 rupees per day for treating covid patients you know people have actually withdrawn their uh, loved one from hospitals because they can't afford to pay and they say now we it is up to god to decide what will happen this is this is the state of misery that that the that the even the middle class are going through those who could afford to put them in private hospitals at 75000 or 100000 rupees a day uh, have run out of their resources and are now pulling their patients out of it banks and corporations are of course making windfall gains because of the stimulus packages that the governments are giving them to survive interestingly beggar mafias are also making a lot of money you know uh, the, if you if you are in karachi or lahore or uh, even islamabad some places rawalpindi you it will it will be interesting to watch that there is never a crowding of beruk uh, beggars in any one street corner or any any signal traffic signal that you have there are always four there generally four is the number you will have at every traffic signal uh, one on each corner of course this is very well managed no one by himself or herself can st stand on the street and beg for money uh, but there's been a large increase of beggars and so the beggar mafias are also making money so the uh, but uh, but the banks and the corporations and the pharmaceutical companies are no different morally than what the beggar mafias are doing they they are all feeding off the miseries of the poor so what covid has done is that it has laid bare the moral bankruptcy of capitalism as an ideology that prioritizes priori puts priority to profits over people people can die and suffer but profits have to be made it has shown that they will make profits from the from graveyards also the, this is this is what uh, capitalism has be, been shown to do we are, everybody all of us knew that was it uh, volumes have been written about it but covid has brought this out widely into the open you know in when the when the covid hit the country somewhere in february march april of 2020 and all these workers were on the streets uh, asking for money uh, you if you if you were in a gathering of 
uh, very rich people, industrialists and others, they were very worried. But the worry was not that the people are suffering. The worry was that today these people are, when we drive past, they have this look in their eyes, appealing for help. But, but tomorrow they will be angry and they will stone our vehicles. This was the worry. The worry was not the misery of the people. The worry was what will happen to them if the misery turns into anger. So th this, is, this, is, this is the face of capitalism. Next, please. <clears throat> So coming back to the economy, the golden age of the cotton economy is over. Textile exports declining, textile manufacture declining, and cotton cultivation declining. These will no longer be the mainstay of the economy. The second is that the market supremacy model is also over. Uh, as was said in the introduction by Vahid Bhatti Sahib, it is the big government is coming back. Uh, markets have failed to deliver. They have not only failed to deliver to the people, the poor, they have even failed to manage the economy under crisis. Uh, you know, they, uh, in, in, the, in the US, there's a saying that when you, when you are squeezed, you cry uncle. That, that's a term is used in the US. Every time there's a crisis, we've seen this in the last 20 years, 30 years, every time there's a crisis, the private sector screams uncle. You know. So, so they've lost their moral uh, sort of standing and this is, is over, government will have to come back. The globalization model is also over. I mean, this whole idea that you can't produce something if somebody else is producing cheaper uh, has, to, has to be dusted off. We, autarky has to be backed, self-sufficiency has to be backed. In the basic commodities of the needs of the people, we cannot subject these commodities to the to the, to the vagaries of the international market forces. We, we have to ensure that the people get these things. Uh, so next, please. So the, if the re-engineer Pakistan's economy, if you are going to move away from export-led growth, then we have to move to rebuild the domestic economy. We are a 200 million plus population. It's a large market. We can, we can run an economy based largely on the domestic market. It is possible to do it. Uh, any any economy will say it, and I, I say this with full responsibility. Uh, and with, uh, so the primary objective of the state has to be food security for the people, housing and its utilities, education and health. These are four things which are absolutely important. I will also like to add one more, which is public transport, because in Pakistani cities, lack of public transport is, is a serious problem. Uh, a fair amount of people's wages, disposable income is spent on public transport. And because public transport is so poor, women have no mobility. Uh, women are stuck in their homes. You know, I, 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 I have two sisters, and before they were married, they were my hostages. Because if I refused to take them somewhere, somewhere, they would just sit at home. So I think this is something that the state has to address. Uh, and we will now have to bring in a system of universal social security. Every citizen has a right on the state. And I think this, this has to be acknowledged and accepted. Pakistan did move in that direction with the introduction of the Benazir Income Support Program in 2008. It was an unconditional cash payment to a very large number of families, up to, up to 5 million families. Uh, so I think this was a step in the right direction, but this has now to go forward. And at least 50% of the population of this country will have to be covered under social security support because of the COVID crisis and the damage it has done to the people's economy. Now, in order to... Uh, make this change, the re-engineering of primary objective of these four or five sectors that the government has to support. The, uh, let, let me repeat, I think somehow my, I, I went,
Uh, wait up, should I? Uh, yes, yes, it? yes, please. This yeah, you slide. have been muted. Yeah, please, sir. Uh, yeah, so I was saying we have to re-engineer Pakistan's economy, move it from export-led growth to the domestic needs of the people. And with 200 million population, we can very easily do that. We are a very large economy, very large purchasing power base, a large market, a large domestic market. <clears throat> food security, housing, utilities, education, public transport. These are the areas the government has to invest its, its resources. And we have to provide social security support. The Nazir Income Support Program was a step in the right direction by the civilian government. And it will need to be expanded because and social security has to be given as a right of the people. Uh, in order to do this, the whole public finance regime the tax and expenditure structure that we have today will have to be re-engineered. Next, please. <clears throat> basic needs of the basic food needs of the people, wheat, pulses, sunflower, from which cooking oil is made, onion, potato, vegetables, milk, meat, eggs, these are these are the basic things that Pakistan has to produce. We do produce sufficient wheat. But every now and then there's a shortfall and we have to import. We have to make sure there are no shortfalls. Pulses, dal, it is a staple food of the poor or at least used to be of the poor. It was saying dal chawal is the, is the meal of the poor. But pulses we import now. Almost 90% of our pulses are imported, which is very expensive. But we can grow our own pulses. And I think the government should ensure that pulses are grown locally. Uh, we we import palm oil uh, from uh, for our cooking oil is from palm oil which is all imported we can grow enough sunflower and produce our own cooking oil we don't need to import pulses or dal we don't need to import uh, our cooking oil raw materials this can be done uh, domestically so we will save a lot of foreign exchange if we do that so we have to minimize the need to import any of the above. Now, where, now if you're going to grow pulses and sunflower, some other things will not need to be grown because you have the fixed acreage. The agricultural land that is cultivated is, is, is fixed. But we have already seen that cotton, demand for cotton will decline. So part of the cotton acreage can be devoted to uh, these essential uh, food crops that we need for our people. Also, the sugarcane is, is a cash crop, and it's a strange industry. Every now and then, sugarcane, uh, sugar surplus uh, happens. So there is already sugar in the godowns, in the storehouses. And the, the next harvest comes, the, the sugar mills say, we are not going to buy any sugarcane because we haven't sold our sugar yet from last year's harvest. So agriculture has begun to scream because their sugar cane, nobody is buying it. So the government gives money to the sugar mill owners to export it. And this is a case of investment, which does not earn us any money, but it's investment that drains our money. So sugar, the entire sugar industry needs to be revisited and sugar cane um, cultivation, uh, except in the coastal districts has to be eliminated and this, acreage should be transferred to producing essential food crops. Next, please. <clears throat> manufacturing also needs to be restructured. Over the last 40 years or so, our manufacturing has become very import intensive. Uh, textile is our biggest export, but except for cotton, Almost all the ingredients that go into making textile is imported. All the chemicals are imported. All the machinery is imported. Every needle is imported. So we have to move away, the, re reduce the import intensity of our manufacturing. Even standard textbooks say that your manufacturing should be based on your own local raw materials, which we are not using. We, we produce rice and we are major exporters of rice. But if you go to any supermarket, you will find rice cereal, which many of us have for breakfast. And I've always wondered whether it is our own rice which has come back to us as cereal, but we don't produce cereal. S same with a lot of mineral products. 
the minerals are exported raw, but their process form is imported and then sold in the markets here. So this, there is a huge potential of creating effective value chains based on agricultural products and minerals and industry that is using local raw materials, both agricultural and, and this will this restructuring will have to take place. Now, in order to do that, two things are necessary. We have to develop existing industrial states and build new industrial states, which are fully serviced and functional with electricity and gas and other facilities for industry to be set up and to function. Over the last 40 years, we have deindustrialized. Industrial states have been shut down and there are housing colonies built in their, in their place. So that, that whole process of deindustrialization will have to be reversed by the appropriate macroeconomic and fiscal policy. Over the last 40 years, macroeconomic and fiscal policy has been anti-industry. This will have to re reverse itself. A complete U-turn has to take place. Manufacturing is subject to 17% GST. And when other taxes are added on, the effective tax rate on manufacturing turns out to be 51%. We are killing our industry. So GST rate has to come down. And we have estimated that it has to come down to 5%. Mainly, the whole process of reindustrialization of Pakistan has to be led by the public sector. The private sector is incapable of leading us. PIDC, which industrialized Pakistan in the 50s and 60s, will have to be revived. And that should again become the vehicle for reindustrialization of Pakistan. Next, please. Now, that is, we are talking of the supply side. If we are going to shift acreage from cotton and from sugarcane to food crops, grow more wheat, grow more dal pulses, grow more of other things that our consumers need. And if you're going to set up industries which are going to produce for local uh, consumption, that is one side of the equation. The other side of the equation is the consumer must have the purchasing power to buy these things. They must have the, pur the, the purchasing power to buy the wheat and the, and the, and the meat and the tomatoes and uh, clothing and shoes and other things that are produced. That will, in the short run, have to come, uh, theoretically, that comes from employment in these very sectors. But in the short run, if, perhaps even in the medium term, that won't be sufficient. Everybody will not get employment overnight. So there will have to be a universal security system that makes monthly payments to about 20 million families. This is half the number of families of the country. This will create the purchasing power. This will create what in microeconomics is called market strength to run the economy. Now, and so, so supply side will be completed by the demand side. And we have, we create a circular flow of income which is within the country. And it is entirely domestically generated. Next, please. <clears throat> so this model that I am, I am presenting creates two gaps. Two questions arise. Where will the fiscal resources for agricultural subsidies come from? Because if you want to in, ensure that farmers produce pulses instead of cotton, which has a higher cotton has a higher value, then you have to compensate the farmers to do that. The government will have to create a pricing mechanism and an incentive structure and a subsidy structure to in, uh, induce farmers to produce crops, uh, which may not command a very high price internationally, but which is essential for the people. So, and the social security payments that are made, where will the fiscal resources come from? And the second is, if we are not uh, into an export-led growth, but there are certain imports which are very essential. For example, petroleum products will have to be imported. Uh, and, and we are running out of gas. So in future, gas will also have to be imported. So where will the foreign exchange come from? Where will the foreign exchange gap be filled? And this is, this is where I think a restructuring of the economy uh, is needed. Uh, next, please. The, the rupee gap, the gap between 
government's revenues which are declining government's expenditures which on which will have to be on development and on providing subsidies to agriculture and for social security that will have to come by reducing non development expenditure and defense expenditure there is no alternative now to reducing these two expenditures there are more than 40 federal divisions in islamabad 20 of them can be shut down you know there is a federal division for national harmony i i can list at least 10 divisions which are which are actually laughable but they are there to provide jobs to bureaucrats and there isn't enough money for services to the people so the about 20 division can be shut down and there will be in huge savings on the non development side there is a huge component of non combat defense expenditure defense expenditure that has nothing to do with fighting a war i am not in favor of a war but okay the security of the country is important one cannot be uh, you know romantic and say we don't need an army of course we need an army we need to provisions for the security of the country but there is a proportion of defense expenditure which has nothing to do with war and that can be reduced i can go into details but this is perhaps is not the i don't have the time to go into those details we have actually worked out the items that if it is cut down will have no impact on the uh, defense capability of the country so both these the civil expenditure on on on, on useless government ministries and non combat defense expenditure has to be cut down that will balance the domestic budget next please uh, on the foreign exchange side <clears throat> we we have created an economy which is very foreign exchange incentives intensive <coughs> industry as i said is dependent on imported imports and imported raw materials but there are there is another sector which uh, has which drains our foreign exchange and that is pol imports uh, petroleum and oil products uh, about a quarter of our import is just this one commodity and why do we import so much because power generation became increasingly dependent on imported furnace oil now we are cutting down on furnace oil but then we are importing gas for power generation and importing coal for power generation it's very strange we will not use our own coal which is in sindh in third third district but we'll import coal i don't know what is the logic of doing that somebody thinks foreign exchange goes on grows on trees perhaps so if we can cut down using imported fuel for power we can save a lot of foreign exchange hydel there is still some capacity for expansion although hydel has a limitation during the four or five win winter months there isn't enough water in the rivers so hydel power production is reduced you do need thermal power production as an alternative source and that can be domestic coal there is enough coal domestically available to do that but there is a huge potential for going solar particularly off grid solar it's already happening in many homes but if the government can promote it in fact half of the western half of balochistan can entirely go on solar you, you don't need long transmission lines to supply power because the longer the transmission line the longer are the higher are the transmission losses of electricity so this whole uh, shift has to take place the a paradigm shift has to take place in how we are producing water power and also on saving power conservation of power our our homes our factories our our vehicles are all power guzzlers you know we 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 build houses which are which are especially the rich build houses which look like houses in switzerland which 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 traps heat inside so then you need air conditioning for 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 your uh, living we 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 need there is a paradigm shift required here the other is other uh, area which uh, consumes a lot of imported fuel is 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 transport sector till the 1970s our our goods transportation was largely on uh, 
uh, rail. Mid, mid 70s onwards, we began to shift towards road. Uh, road transport uses one third more fuel for, per kilometer than rail. Now, if we can rehabilitate our railways and shut down the road transport, particularly NLC, then we will start saving foreign exchange. So these, these paradigm shifts have to take place to, to steer the economy away from its dependence on foreign exchange and, and stop the drain of foreign exchange. Once you do that, you don't have the balance of payments problem and you don't have to kneel before international banks and uh, uh, Saudi Arabia and China begging for loans and more loans. Uh, we, we, we can make our economy more balanced and sustainable. Uh, next, please. Finally, I want to say that the primary purpose of the state, rather the only purpose of the state, is to address the collective needs of the people. It is not the purpose of the state to create an enabling environment for the private sector to maximize profits. And if the state cannot address the basic needs of the people, questions will arise about their, its rationale to exist. And that is where I want to end. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Kasser. Uh, thank you, very insightful presentation. Uh, and I think it uh, gives us a lot of food for thought that uh, uh, what was the situation pre-COVID, during COVID, and I think the COVID has, pro uh, despite all the negative impacts, it has uh, pushed us uh, into rethink the whole thing along the lines you have just explained. And it is not just Pakistan, but I think all even all the developed economies and countries, they are talking about a total shift uh, in their thinking in restructuring their economies and the way they produce and the way they live. So it has, uh, it's a kind of started uh, this new, new thinking process. And I think with that, uh, uh, Rana Sahib, if you can start taking questions because this is where we will start discussion questions and answers uh, please ask by all means whatever is on your mind uh, there are no no go areas but please make sure that you are brief to that allows everyone to participate and you stay within the topic because that will help us to go vertical into the topic rather than broadening our discussion thank you yeah, thank you very much, uh, Wahid Bhatti, and uh, thank you very much, of course, uh, Dr. Bengali, for uh, such a in-depth uh, uh, presentation uh, and also proposing uh, uh, alternative uh, economy for uh, for Pakistan. However, uh, as Wahid Bhatti has said, that uh, we are here to discuss uh, the inequalities, imbalances, injustices created. Uh, by the uh, by capitalism and especially it it has been exposed during this pandemic uh, uh, times so uh, please keep your questions uh, related to the covid and capitalism so um, and please raise your hands i can see you all and uh, one by one i would ask you to unmute yourself and then ask questions so here, um, Masood Mirza Saab, uh, do you want to ask some question? Please unmute yourself. Okay, later Masood Mirza Saab, we, we are coming to, uh, towards you. Uh, Mansoor Alam, please. Sorry. Uh I have two questions with uh, Dr. Saab. My first question is, why all the pharmaceutical companies do not work together for R&D and production? Dr. Bengali, there is a question by Mansoor Ralam. Should I answer individual questions or take a few questions and then answer? Oh, okay, okay, sir. Right? Okay, sir. Okay. okay uh, Mansoor I... Alam, your next question, please. Why there is no fair distribution of COVID vaccine in Europe and rest of the world? On what basis do some countries get prior priority while others have to wait? Yeah. And, and now, Masood Mirza, please. Thank you, please. 
Thank you for the thought provoking and illuminating lecture, Dr. Saib. Could you please say a few words about the role of the military uh, in economic se sector? Because during the past few decades, the military have established a vast uh, economic empire. For, ex for example, Foji Foundation, Army, Welfare Trust, NLC, you have already mentioned, Bahria Foundation and Shaheen. And they even also uh, own uh, vast land masses, for example, more than 11 million acres. Uh, could you please tell us whether uh, the military or milbos, as they call military business, what is their role as taxpayer? Do they pay taxes and they play an important role in economic development or it is a non-productive sector? Thank, Thank you, you Masoom uh, Dr. Bengali, please. Uh, yeah. um, and uh, I, I, first... I request you, sir, I request you to please uh, concentrate more on uh, COVID and capitalism, please. Yes, I think I will, I will uh, with all due respect to Masood Mirza Sahib, I will skip that question. Uh, I think I've covered that in some sense. Uh, the capitalist state that Pakistan is uh, encompasses a number of players, the military being one of them. So I think all my comments on the Pakistani capitalist state also apply to the military industrial complex that we have in Pakistan. The, the earlier question, why pharmaceutical companies don't collaborate and why vaccine is not being distributed equally. Uh, the point is that since the world has started, uh, it has never been a fair world. Uh, companies, countries uh, protect their interests, promote their interests. They go to war to promote their interests. They, they create massive destruction and death in other countries to protect their interests, whoever is powerful. I think Genghis Khan uh, did it. Uh, all the colonial powers did it. Uh, in our own time, the Americans have done it. Uh, so so this, this is not something uh, that is happening for the first time. And these companies are competitors. They, why will they come? They are competitors at two levels. Within a country also, one company competes with others, but there is some kind of nationalism that has uh, come up, vaccine nationalism. Uh, whether you are for the Russian vaccine or Chinese vaccine, uh, the Indians then uh, have produced their own vaccine. They don't allow uh, others a space. Uh, but this is, this is how the world is. And we, we can, we can all hope and pray that morality will rule the world, but it doesn't happen. This is how it has been and this is how it will be. And this is how we'll have to uh, battle it and fight for whatever uh, egalitarianism that we can save out of this uh, chaos. Thank you. Uh, Mohammed Isa, can you please unmute yourself and ask question? Uh, thank you, sir. Uh, thank you, Dr. Saab. Uh, my name is Mohammad Islam and I'm from Rajasthan. Uh, I'm a student of PhD from Kairiyaz University, Islamabad. Uh, the structure which you have presented um, of the economic reforms is a purely economic model. But, sir, uh, I think that there is a political dimension to that too. So, how will you deal with that political dimension where you, where you don't have a legitimate government uh, facing the crisis of legitimacy that uh, it is brought by the establishment? So how an illegitimate government, uh, so-called, can bring out those economic reforms which you suggest? I think this. Thank you, Mohammed. I, 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 I want. Let me let me answer this. Yeah. Uh, I uh, my my sort of whole review takes into account uh, seventy years of Pakistan, uh, the first thirty years, which is the development state period, and the second the later post-77 period, which is the uh, security state period, uh, it, in, it covers a number of governments. Uh, some can be said to be legitimate, some can be said to be non-legitimate. Uh, we don't need to get into this debate because the thrust of economic policy over the last 40 years has been the same. The powers that determine economic policy have been the same. Uh, from 1993 
most of the state bank governors have been appointees of international financial institutions. That's from 1993. So whether, uh, whether whatever the nature of the government, whether civilian, military, selected, uh, they have all followed the dictates of the international financial organizations in managing policy. So I, I'm not really concerned about uh, whether the legitimacy of government. Of course, it is important, uh, but from, from the perspective of the, whether there is bread on the, on the, for the poor, uh, it, it, it has made no difference. Yeah, thank you. Uh, Raish Salim Saab, please unmute yourself and then ask question. Okay. Uh, can you listen to me? Yes. Okay. Uh, thank you, Dr. Saab, uh, for your uh, uh, very inter interesting uh, uh, information. Uh, I feel uh, a little bit informed now. Uh, I have learned today uh, that uh, I, I will tell that in short that we have a disaster economy in Pakistan. You have explained it very well uh, with all uh, details. And uh, there are uh, the reason for that are. Uh, on the one hand, uh, the uh, indus industrial uh, uh, owners, as well as uh, um, feudals, uh, and the corrupt bureaucracy, maybe. Uh, and uh, but, your uh, I missed, but I missed uh, uh, that uh, to know what is the connection uh, between the I think you have uh, made uh, certain uh, uh, valuable uh, programs. How uh, to recover? Uh, uh, how how one can uh, uh, develop a new uh, economy, a new fundament for the economy, uh, 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 without uh, uh, these gaps? Uh, what do you say, dollar gap, and uh, uh, other. Uh, uh, things. I missed uh, the connection of uh, IMF, World Bank, and uh, World Trade Organization. If we have a very efficient government in Pakistan, uh, as you uh, described it very well, and all the things you are going to change uh, in some modus, uh, but uh, I know that uh, uh, there is a dollar gap by you, uh, what you said, uh, one uh, uh, euro uh, uh, now has a value of about 200 rupees. And I know uh, at the early of 70s, when I left Pakistan, I paid 2.4, uh, 240, 2.40 uh, rupees for one dollar at that time. And there is some reasons. Uh, why there is uh, the value of Pakistani rupees decrees to uh, 200 rupees for one do uh, for one euro. Uh, could you please uh, explain in some way uh, how it functions? Uh, what's the reason behind it? Thank you, uh, Ray Salim Saab from Germany. Raksha, please. The, uh, I am presenting a model, an analysis and a model, but I am in no position to implement anything. The connection has to be people who have to organize and fight for their rights. We are seeing a brilliant display of people's power in India right now. They are up against the power of the Indian government, the power of the multinational corporations that are behind it. And this is the way to go. If we want to uh, change anything for the better, then we will have to organize, we will have to mobilize, and we will have to be out on the streets. The Pakistan has, we, we know, from the year 2000 onwards, we have seen representatives or appointees of international financial institutions holding key posts in Pakistan. 
including that of prime minister, finance minister, state bank governor. Uh, so there has been a collusion of the establishment and foreign capital. <coughs> and that has taken away our economic sovereignty and our political sovereignty. When your prime minister wishes to go to Kuala Lumpur to meet uh, the prime minister heads of Turkish and Iranian governments and Saudi Arabia tells Pakistan, you can't go and we don't go, which clearly tells us that we don't have political sovereignty anymore. We can't even protect our birds. The, the, when, when, the, when one part of the government put a ban on uh, hunting of birds in Pakistan by uh, Gulf uh, royalty, uh, the response of the government of Pakistan is that it will hurt our foreign policy. We can't protect our we can't even protect our birds. So we've lost our, effectively, we've lost our economic sovereignty and our political sovereignty. And we will have to launch a new struggle for independence. We fought for independence in the 1940s, but a new struggle for independence has to be fought. And it has to be fought on the streets. Thank you very much. much. My uh, question was- uh, Four more uh, questions. No, uh, sir, uh, there, uh, I, I come to you, Reis Bhai, again. Uh, just save your question. And uh, now, uh, Dr. Ishtiak, please unmute yourself. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Kesar Bengali. We met once in Lahore, I remember. And uh, this was an excellent argument in favor of bringing back the state. You know, the welfare state model on which Sweden developed was exactly this, that while the market may freely function in the use of the factors of production, the state must represent justice and should intervene so that the wealth produced nationally is fairly shared. And I think what you are saying is a third world way of doing the same. I think I totally endorse your uh, argument for it. And I do hope this happens. My questions has to do with the role of the PDIC that you took up. If I remember, it was the World Bank which financed PIDC. And because Pakistan lacked its own uh, capital resources. And the idea that the World Bank would finance it, that the American connection was the Marshall Plan, which had put Western Europe back on its feet. And this was done primarily to present Pakistan as a successful case of a market economy vis-a-vis -vis India that you talked about, the Hindu rate of growth, where the state, in order to create equality, was controlling the free flow of uh, market forces. So one question is, PIDC did not generate its own resources, but they were borrowed. And there is Papanek's report on it, uh, praising the way it had been handled in Pakistan until we came to the 1965 war. But on that, I want your uh, uh, comment. I come into the modern period. Pakistan is now completely involved in CPEC and in the Chinese control of our economy. Do you think that the model do you want Pakistan to pursue has any chance of getting realized in any uh, a realistic manner within CPEC where we are stuck? Or you are talking about a way out of all these dependencies that we have had in the past and returning the sovereignty of the people and the national sovereignty. And, and those ideas are fantastic, but how are you going to do it? I mean, what you identify is perfectly acceptable, morally defensible, and that's the way forward. But what are the possibilities for realizing what you are telling us? Thank you, Dr. Ishak. Yeah, I, I'll answer your last question first, which I've already answered to 
your question. The how depends on mobilizing the people and getting them on the street. This is what the farmers in India are doing. This is what we will have to do here. If we want to reclaim our economic sovereignty and our political sovereignty and create, rather recreate a state that is designed to serve the people. Your two other questions are very, very good. Uh, PIDC was not a brainchild of the World Bank. Uh, World Bank came to Pakistan in a big way in the 1960s, uh, one after the Ayub Khan coup. Uh, PIDC was established in the 1950s. And uh, subsequently, yes, the resources began to flow in to Pakistan and a part of that resources, a lot of the uh, foreign funding in the 1960s were in, were in arms, military, military uh, investment. But it also came into economic investment, and uh, the uh, whatever the form of the government, it it was committed to economic development. That credit you to all governments from 1907 to 1977, irrespective of its political uh, orientation. So they used those resources uh, productively, and 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 PIDC was uh, set up. I I also want to uh, say this that till the 1970s. Pakistan, the loans that Pakistan took from the World Bank and other, other agencies were project loans. They were loans to set up projects. So we set up this uh, Sarbela Dam, Mangla Dam, and uh, uh, power stations and, uh, the, the, and other investments that were made. Uh, they were all project loans. To, from the 1990s onwards, we now take program loans. We don't take project loans. So we take now this, the last few years we've come down to the level. We are now taking loans from the World Bank to collect garbage from the streets. This is where we have fallen. When you take a project loan, you create a project, new income is generated. And with that new income, you can always pay back the loan. But program loans, you don't generate any new income. So there is no way of repaying the loan. So we now take loans to repay past loans. But there was another factor to the loans we were taking in the 50s and the 60s and the 70s, the 30, 30, 30 years. Even for the project loans, the foreign loans were for the foreign exchange component of that project. The rupee component of that project, the government of Pakistan generated itself. So if the Tarbela was built, the rupee component of Tarbela was out of Pakistan's own rupee resources. Whatever foreign exchange component in terms of machinery to be imported or foreign consultants to be paid, that was the foreign component loan. Now we are taking foreign loans even to pay salaries to our lower staff. Every rupee of expenditure, whether foreign exchange or rupee expenditure, comes out of a foreign loan. So this is this is this is a structural change in the pattern of loans that has happened in the last 30 years, 40 years. That has to change. Uh, PIDC has to come back. If, if foreign loans are taken to set up industries and it is the loans are only covering foreign exchange, that is a good thing. There is nothing wrong in principle in taking a loan, but you take a loan only when it increases your income, future income. That is the only justification for taking a loan. And, and, and we will, of course, all businesses take loans and all countries have to take loans. In principle, loans are not bad. Loans are bad if you take loan. If I take a loan to get my son married and invite 10,000 um, guests, uh, feed them, uh, 10 course, 20 course meal and send them away. And the next morning the bills come and I don't know uh, how to pay them. And then I have to sell my assets to pay the, the caterers. And that is not the kind of development that we, we should do. And that's what we have been doing. So your other questions about CPEC. We are so beholden to the Western financial system and so much in control by Western financial managers. Uh, uh, today, since the year 2000, that the, that, the, that the possibility of Pakistan 
moving out of the Western sphere into the Chinese sphere really does not exist. The Chinese uh, sphere only is a bogey uh, to try to scare the Indians. Uh, CPEC itself is very badly designed. Uh, I have generated 12 questions on CPEC. It was, I, I generated this question sometime in 2016. Uh, I see very little benefit to Pakistan from CPEC. And simple one example I will give you. The Quadar port revenues are to be distributed between China and Pakistan in the ratio of 91 to 9. Pakistan gets 9% of Gwadar port revenues. China gets 91%. That is the, that in a way is epitomizes the nature of the agreement that we are reaching with China. But right now with, with the kind of uh, Western financial control there is on Pakistan's economy, CPEC has been put on hold. CPEC can be a great game changer for us. CPEC can change the economic geography of our country just as Tarbela and Mangla changed the economic geography of the country. But provided we do it right, and we are not doing it right, it is, we have not carried out any feasibility studies of, of CPEC. No one in the last, since 2016, the questions that I've been asking, these questions have also been put by parliamentarians as parliament questions, and they have not been answered. So the CPEC is not going anywhere. If at all, it will just give China a foothold of some sort, and the Chinese placard is being placed to, to, to to, be, to enable our establishment to face off India. Uh, otherwise, uh, I don't see much in terms of economic benefits to Pakistan or, and specifically not to Balochistan. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, um, I just want to recall all the participants. I'm going to take your question, Asfandia, Riaz Sheikh, uh, Savdar Zaidi and others as well. But uh, I request you all to please uh, be specific to uh, your question. Uh, uh, your questions uh, should be specific to our discussion at this moment. Pakistan, Pakistan's economy is not the uh, point of discussion. We are discussing uh, capitalism as a global system, which actually has been exposed during uh, this uh, Corona crisis. Yes, Asfandiyar, please ask your question. Assalamu alaikum. I, I hope so. I'm ID open. Yes. Uh, sir, actually, I have two questions. First of all, I'm thankful to you for uh, such worthy session. Sir, my first question is how the private sectors reopen or defame the public sectors? I mean, what tricks they use? I was just randomly that day uh, calculating the education uh, about students that the uh, private sector, uh, they invest 150 or 300 rupees per student. On the other hand, in public schools, the government invests 1400 or 1600 rupees per student. But yet, people move to private schools rather than public school. And my second question is that we are talking about neoliberalism and we are talking about pure democracy. Uh, sir, I am just asking a simple question. What type... Uh, in pure democracy, how the uh, politi uh, political party would uh, choose their their candidate? I mean, they have to choose uh, their elite class candidate. In pure democracy, what trick is better uh, where uh, the candidate don't invest in campaigns and they, uh, I mean, I mean to say, and they come uh, for it. I hope so. You got my question, sir. Yes, I did. Thank you, Asandar. Uh, Thank you, sir. Your first question, uh, the, the new liberal capitalists uh, launched a massive campaign to blacken the face of the public sector. As I said earlier that Pakistan's industrialization for the first 20 years of Pakistan's history was actually initiated by the public sector. 
this fact has been erased and everybody now believes i i teach in the university and my students also believe that the public sector is very bad all it has is loss making units but i i i recount to them units public sector units even now today that are making profits and doing very well and they 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 don't have an answer to that because they think they have been told that public sector is always bad and private sector is always good now you mentioned universities higher fees in private universities yes people prefer to send them to private universities but who sends them to private universities only those who can afford to send their children to private universities those who can't afford to send their children to private universities send them to public universities or not at all so there is a vast section of the population which is completely excluded from education because if 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 private universities are charging high fees they are also paying better salaries to their teachers so a large number of public university teachers have quit public universities and gone into private universities so private universities have some good teachers whereas public universities are without good teachers so education suffers so those who can't afford to send their children to private schools send them to public schools and have bad education because they have bad education they can't compete in the market for better jobs so they remain low paid or remain without jobs whereas those who have gone to private schools pick up all the good jobs in the country this actually this whole education has been turned into a commodity private universities are not educational centers ye taleem gah nahi hai ye dukaan hai they are shops which sell education we have turned education into a commodity it is no longer it is no longer a function of expanding learning of 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 creating knowledge of disseminating knowledge that's what education is all about but no longer it's all about a commodity that a shop called the university is selling and teachers are no longer teachers they are they are employees who are supposed to uh, deliver the product to the client you know so so this is this is what neoliberalism has done to and this is this is a this is a destruction of our values i mean take hospitals for example i mentioned that there are hospitals private hospitals who are minting money they have become billionaires in the last few months by charging between 50000 to 150000 rupees per day as, as, as hospital charges the whole idea of a doctor was to a service to humanity to heal those in pain this this is the whole principle of medicine but we have turned hospitals into shops where a product called medical care is sold to whoever can pay if you can't pay you you pray to god to help you and die and in my in my research career i have actually come across cases where they have said that we can't afford this treatment anymore he is now in god's hands this is this has repeatedly come in our surveys that we we come across so this is what neoliberal capitalism has done more than the damage to our the economy of the people more than the damage of unemployment and poverty that they have created they have destroyed our whole moral fiber they have destroyed our moral way of thinking education is no longer the purpose of education is no longer to advance knowledge the purpose of healthcare is no longer to 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 reduce the suffering of those who are sick both these are now products commodities that are sold whoever can buy it can buy it those who cannot buy it should just pray to god 
Thank you, Dr. Bengali. Uh, um, let me ask you a question related to, again, uh, COVID. Um, uh, in your um, own uh, presentation, you have said globalization. And uh, we have seen uh, that uh, in this era of globalization and capitalism, we have, uh, we have been uh, sensing a vaccine war among countries, vaccine nationalism uh, is on, on rise. So what do you think? Because these uh, countries uh, who have waged vaccine wars and uh, uh, nationalism uh, is on the rise, they are capitalist countries. They have promoting cap capitalism since long. So what impact in the global economy would, uh, would, would be uh, in this scenario? I, 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 it, it is not nice to make very pessimistic predictions, but right now, uh, what the worst case scenario is that those countries that have succeeded in producing a vaccine, and those are countries which have invested heavily in the past in their medical systems, uh, and India is one of them, uh, they will certainly uh, benefit by exporting vaccines to countries that are not producing vaccines, Pakistan being one of them. Uh, Pakistan does not have the money, the foreign exchange to import vaccines, so Pakistan will have to take loans. So we will become more indebted. We will have to go uh, on our knees uh, if, uh, and, and uh, kiss and uh, beg before uh, loans for whoever is giving us loans to buy, uh, buy vaccine. Uh, within the country, uh, the rich will immediately access uh, the, 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 the vaccines. They know where to go. They know which uh, number to plug into their uh, lap, uh, into their phones and uh, get into the queue. The poor uh, are not tech savvy in that sense. Uh, of course, the poor, all the poor have phones now, but that doesn't mean they're tech savvy. They can't really access uh, all the apps that are uh, available for these things. So the, the gap between the rich and the poor are going to, is going to rise. Already we have seen the mortality rate uh, of the vulnerable population from even in the United States, the blacks, for example, in other, uh, is very high. Uh, this will also happen. Uh, if the rich get vaccinated and the poor don't get vaccinated, then COVID will become a disease of the poor. Although, having said that, I think there is a bright side to this. Uh, COVID is a disease that will not protect anyone. Uh, it will not protect the rich within our countries, uh, even if they are vaccinated, and it will not protect the rich countries because uh, one traveler from an unvaccinated poor country landing into a vaccinated rich country can can again spread the disease. So it will be the in, it will be I think in the self interest of the rich countries and the rich within countries to make sure that everybody is at the end of the day vaccinated. I I I I'm I'm hopeful and optimistic that in their own self interest this will happen. Just as you know. 1917, the Red Revolution took place and succeeded in Russia. It's very interesting that it is 1920 that the ILO was formed because the capitalists of Western Europe realized that if we don't give something to the labor, we will all go communist. So they, they began to, for their own self-interest, they, they, they created labor laws, they created working hours, they created minimum wage. All this is post-1917. If the Red Revolution in Russia had not taken place, none of this would have happened in Western Europe. The Western Europe's uh, welfare state would not have existed today. All the, the people of Western Europe, the, the, the working class in particular, uh, have to thank Soviet Russia for whatever uh, protection they have. Similarly, I think 
the, the rich countries and the rich and poor countries in their own self-interest, they will be forced to make sure that vaccine is available to everybody. Ranasam, can I add something to what? Uh, yes, Dr. please. And to your question, because uh, it's a very uh, extremely interesting insight what uh, what you have given, uh, Doctor Saab. But I think there are to, to to this whole vaccine thing and COVID thing, and then the exposures we are talking about, and the question Ranasam asked. There are essentially two components. Uh, one is the political component, and one is the economic component, uh, because because in in this. Uh, uh, economic structures, uh, prevailing economic structures, profitability, profit of a business is, is the core thing. I mean, that's that's the key motivation to do anything. And then there is the po poly politics is. Now, anything, you know, the, the, the ongoing uh, quarrel between Russia and, and Europe, for example, and rest of the rest of the world. So the vaccine actually the first came from Russia and it was widely condemned and uh, doubts created about it, about the Chinese vaccination. Uh, and it was that was the trading blocks. If you look at different trading blocks, the world is divided into, they immediately went into defense that Russian, it's not properly tested, it can't be good and this and that, and we can never use this. And now last week, the test proof that the Russian vaccination, uh, the Sputnik, it is 91.6% effective actually more effective than many other vaccinations which are developed and produced in the West. So there you see, and then there is a political pressure why people are buying like crazy. I mean, why Canada would buy so much, uh, I mean, that they can get give 10 vaccinations to each person, why Europe with pre-order, because there is a lot of pressure, not only to sustain their industry, but they have to go into next elections. And there is a lot of pressure from nationalists, from protectionists, from right-wing extremists. And if they don't say Holland first, America first, Germany first, they will, they will tend to lose that. I mean, the oppositions, the right-wing opposition will create a hell for them and they will lose the next election. Like, listen, they went, they distributed vaccine to Africa, Africa, while our own people needed that. And you will, you can be hundred percent sure you will can lose an election on that uh, on that scandal. So there are these two components which force these uh, these governments to do anyway to protect their trade blocks, uh, to make political gains, and to make sure that uh, they, they win the next next election. And Russia is the bad guy of the world, and China is the bad guy of the world. Thank you, sir. Just uh, wanted to add Ali Khan. Uh... Can you please unmute yourself? You want wanted to ask question? Yes, thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Kasser, for a very um, invigorating uh, and thoughtful um, lecture. Uh, my question is about uh, the devolution in Pakistan and the absence of uh, local government um, as it relates to the whole uh, scenario of vaccination equity, if uh, you want to call it. Um, how do you think uh, that that is going to uh, roll out uh, in the presence of, uh, you know, the vaccination being controlled by the NCOC at the center? Thank you. Thank you, Alia. Thank you. Uh, good to hear you, Alia. How are you? Uh, I'm thank you. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> let me also, uh, there, there, are, there are two or three questions that have come up. Ali, I'll come to your question uh, about trading blocks. The battle between trading block was always there and remains so. Vaccine is just another front that has opened up, and that's how it's going to play out. And this uh, economic nationalism that has emerged will also erode the whole globalization um, infrastructure that has been created in the last half a, half a century. So there, uh, there are minuses and there are pluses to that. And, but it all depends on how we play it and how we exploit it. And the earlier question uh, by Asfandiar about uh, pure democracy, et cetera, you know, the, my, the issue is really we have always debated democracy versus dictatorship in Pakistan, military versus civilian. But the, that is not the real divide. I think we are, we are sort of 
targeting the wrong uh, debate. The real issue is the social base of the ruling class. The social base of the ruling class, if the social base of the ruling class, which is the dictatorship, is progressive, then you will have progress. You will have development. Uh, Singapore is one example. The, the, it was a dictatorship. Of course, it has muzzled freedom of speech and all that. But it delivered on economic development. It transformed a very medieval economy into a, one of the most modern economies of the world. China is another example. It's a dictatorship. But the social base of that dictatorship is to deliver economic development. And it has pulled out record numbers of people out of poverty. It has not happened in the world history of the world. But there are democracies with uh, Pakistan where the social base is feudals and uh, military chiefs and uh, tribal chiefs. That democracy, whether it's a democracy or a dictatorship, it doesn't matter. So I think we have to make some internal changes. If we want to fight on any front, we have to be strong ourselves. We have to be organized. Alia, your question is very relevant to managing the fallout from COVID. We have seen, you know, in, in China, in Wuhan, when they locked down Wuhan, they did not allow anyone to leave their homes, but they delivered food to everyone in their homes because the government of Wuhan, it was not the government of China, it was the local government of Wuhan, which knew exactly who lives where. We have seen, I, I, I live in Karachi and we've seen in Karachi, there was, the, the government simply had no uh, clue how to reach out to people. If, if you're going to shut down people in their homes, then how are they going to uh, have three meals a day? Or let's say one meal a day. The, this is where local government would have been very, very effective. Because a local government decentralized they know the people, they know where people live and where they are. So I think the, uh, this has brought out the importance of local government. And local, wherever there is local government, big, gov big corporations don't command that much power because when political power is dispersed horizontally, then any one of the local governments can actually deny a corporation uh, space in their territory. So, but when you have centralized government, monopolistic government, then all it takes is a phone call from the CEO of a corporation to the president or the prime minister and things happen. So I think it is very important that local government become effective. But in Pakistan, again, we have been targeting the wrong debate. Uh, my own view on local government is that it's a constitutional problem. There is a chapter in our constitution on federal government and a chapter on provincial government. Each of these two chapters defines the structure, the powers and the functions of the respective government. There is no such chapter on local government. There's only one line in the constitution which says that provincial governments shall institute local governments what kind of local government, what powers they want to give them, what functions they want to give them, what money they want to give them is entirely up to the provincial government. And every time a new government changes, the structure and the power and the function of local government changes. So, so, so the real issue that we have to have is place, the real battle that we should fight is to have a chapter in our constitution on local government, which broadly defines the structure, powers and functions of local government. But local government has become very important. And it is important, decentralized government is important to fight big corporations also, because that can be fought. And, and we have seen in the United States also, you know, while, while Trump was heading in one direction, there were governors who were heading in the other direction. And this can only happen if you have that kind of decentralized power sharing. So, so I, I, I think it's a good question, Alia, and we, this is an agenda for all of us to follow. Unmute. Oh, sorry. Uh, thank you, Dr. Shab. And uh, we have to uh, actually formally uh, conclude this uh, dialogue. Uh, 
but uh, after uh, formally concluding this dialogue, we would uh, sit. Uh, yeah, it is our normal routine that we, we would sit uh, for another half an hour to talk uh, on, on the uh, matters uh, of uh, mutual interest. And obviously some questions that could not be asked during this uh, formal session may be asked later. So uh, while um, uh, yeah, going to, to, to end this uh, formal uh, session, I want to ask Wasim, Riyaz Sheikh, and uh, uh, Sabdar Zaidi, to quickly ask your questions so that uh, Dr. Shab uh, could uh, reply them. Yes, Wasim. Unmute. Okay, Wasim, unmute yourself. Thank you. Yeah, please. Uh, you mentioned uh, about the, the abandonment of uh, export-led growth. And can, uh, can't export export let growth actually help a country if you have uh, protectionist measures where you where you make sure that the capital comes in and uh, the people of the country or the companies or the national assets of the country which are which is receiving that uh, capital are protected uh, by protectionist measures. This happened in Singapore. This happened in South Korea, and this also is also happening in China. What's your uh, thought about that? Thank you, Wasim. Riyaz Sheikh, your question, please. Thank you very much. First of all, can you congratulations to Dr. Sab for uh, such a nice session. My question is, Dr. Sab, uh, you have seen that despite this lockdown, there has been tremendous increase in uh, foreign remittances to poor economies, including Pakistan. So what is your suggestion that how long uh, it will continue? Because it has provided a huge support support to uh, a budget deficit. And second is what will happen to situation when uh, these remittances return to a pre covered uh, situation. My second uh, question will be, okay, there is a there is, there is a expedite process of privatization in poor countries, especially in Pakistan, like we have seen okay, Pakistan steel mill and other things that they are going to uh, be privatized soon. So what will be the impact if we have this covered situation for a few months more? My third is, this pension issue is becoming very, very alarming issue globally and in Pakistan. Paul Mason has mentioned this issue. So how these things will be going to affect all this? Sorry for these questions. Thank, thank you, Riaz. Uh, and uh, uh, lastly, by uh, Sabdar Zaidi, please unmute yourself. Sabdar. Okay, Sabdar is not listening. Doksha, please. You know the. Uh... In the 50s, and even in the 60s, the World Bank was promoting import substitution growth. And, and their support to Pakistan's industrialization, especially in the 60s, was all based on import substitution growth. Korea decided to sort of take a different line. They adopted export-led growth and which the World Bank then opposed. But when Korea succeeded, the World Bank changed its stack and asked every other country to go for export-led growth. Now, you can have export-led growth, but for export-led growth, you have to have an economy that is efficient and competitive, and of course, skilled. This is where education and skill comes in. Pakistan's skill level is absolutely low, you know, some of the uh, countries in the bottom of the world, uh, we would rank uh, in terms of our skill. We are simply not able to take advantage of the export opportunities that the world offers. Every free trade agreement that we have signed, our imports have gone up and our exports have stagnated. So we are, we are not really equipped for export-led growth. And only a handful of Foreign corporations and some Pakistani corporations have benefited from this because our export-led growth is supported by government subsidies. The textile industry operates on subsidies. They have all kinds of subsidies. There are cheaper electricity and uh, being given right now. Uh, the, so 
what is the use of exporting something when the exporter has to be paid for that export and that money comes out of the pocket of the poor so this this whole model of export led growth has really bankrupted our economy we are resource rich pakistan is a resource rich country <coughs> we can produce all the food we need and we can produce all the clothing that we need we can produce all the leather for the shoes that we need so the, so my point is that we we will of course have to be remain part of the world trading system but for the very basic commodities we should get out of the world trading system we should produce these basic commodities ourselves so that the people can have access to it if i if i want designer clothes or designer shoes i can have that provided every pakistani has clothes and shoes on his and her body so th that is the model we have to follow we cannot i can figure that out the about foreign exchange remittances my hunch government is not releasing figures but my hunch is that because of the recession in middle eastern countries uh, people are being laid off and they are coming back we have evidence that they are coming back i have had phone calls from people who have come back and asking if i can place them somewhere so when people come back they bring their money with them and i think this may be a one time spurt in 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 remittances and uh, all when 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 everybody when when the bulk of our labor comes has come back then of course there will be no future remittances uh, coming in uh, privatization is uh, a subject of our uh, slavery that we have assigned ourselves uh, you know we, we we are now our economic policy is run by agents of uh, international financial organizations uh, and they they of course will privatize everything at low cost to foreign uh, uh, interests uh, they have already done this our, uh, 80% plus of our banking sector is now in foreign hands our entire telecommunication sector is in foreign hands so this this will continue unless and until the people can organize and fight back thank you uh, dr kesar bangali and uh, um, uh, may i ask uh, uh, wahid bhatti please can, can you please conclude that uh, today's uh, sure. formal session okay okay i will just do uh, do go back to share a screen for a second with you guys so is that okay hello yes sir yes it is yes yeah. it okay is. all right thank you thank you now let's uh, i think it has been uh, extremely inspiring and informative session and it's as problem is with all these sessions that we can uh, never be exhaustive we cannot uh, deal with all the points and all the questions actually it raises lots of lots of very interesting new questions but thank you uh, thank you dr sir let me let me just uh, summarize some of the highlights uh, and 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 say something you can take home to think about i think we talked about disaster capitalism and its uh, predatory nature and i would still for those interested and you all are very much interested in these topics would love to recommend uh, two 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 readings to you one was the shock doctrine uh, by naomi klein and uh, and the other one is by anthony loewenstein called disaster capitalism and they have really thoroughly researched this subject not in relation to to covid but in relation to many other uh, disasters which have happened uh, so you can see the the pattern in it and a lot of information which is evidence based information one thing we we also heard from uh, 
from Dr. Saab and uh, in, 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 in other, uh, in my, some of the slides that there will be very prolonged recovery period for developing countries. I mean, the crisis, the economic crisis is still is not that severe in developed economies. And, uh, and it's very strange, actually, almost contradictory that the stock market is, is, is booming while uh, we are talking about uh, uh, a recession. Uh, so there is no really recession because when you see in the in this capitalist system, when they need money, and when they either they have to, uh, I mean, put some of their plans in place, and if they want to go to a war, suddenly no one ever asks where the money comes from, and suddenly you have trillions and trillions of dollars just raining from the heaven, and they can finance all these wars and all these disasters the way they want. But just imagine that that five minutes before COVID started, if someone would have, someone would have gone to these guys and said, we need about uh, 100 million more for education or 200 million more for, uh, for the healthcare, they would say, no, where will it come from? We have no money. We are already running a budget deficit, but suddenly they have trillions and trillions of dollars. Uh, while this is happening, we see the multinationals being aided. I mean, KLM is an example, many other multinational companies which uh, hardly pay any tax, which are actually thieves when it comes to tax. They are given billions and dollars of tax uh, uh, benefits and uh, uh, postponement of taxes uh, and, and aid. I mean, for example, KLM was uh, said, okay, we will only give them money if they don't fire anyone. Okay, agreed. They take the money and then they start firing people. Uh, so while this is happening, we see millions uh, pushed as we saw into extreme poverty, living on one and a half dollar per day. Uh, there are increased risks because of the pandemic of conflicts, of migration, of crime, violence, depression, etc. A good thing what's happening is that people, as doctors have very nicely explained, that we all start now feeling the need to reassess how we invest, where we invest, the governments or even the private sector. We have to evaluate what is the benefit of investing for profit or investing in welfare of the people. Because if things would have been invested properly, even in developed economies, in welfare, before COVID, we wouldn't have that kind of drama. It is because the money was continuously taken out of the healthcare uh, and or things being outsourced, things being privatized. Uh, and this is what happens. Now they are thinking of bringing some of the production back to their countries. So that has been an impact. And healthcare and basic services, they should not be for the free market. I mean, they, it is not for trade. People's health and water and gas and education, these basic things they need to live for every day it cannot be traded on a free market and, and, and this kind of fluctuation and, and profit-driven uh, markets. Uh, so what is good thing with what COVID did is opened our eyes a bit more, a bit wider. And we see now that capitalism and neoliberalism are under pressure. They are really, really on the defensive. They have to explain themselves. They have to uh, defend themselves. Uh, and there has been consequently a surge in the left movements. And it's very interesting to see even in Holland or, or everywhere actually globally, that the, the center left, left or social democratic political parties who during last 30 years slowly started moving towards the right, uh, they are now coming back to their fundamentals, coming back to their basics and moving towards the left. And if you see their new election programs being printed or being published, you see very clearly that they are trying to hold on now to some, some philosophy, uh, not just uh, 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 market economy. Uh, we see actually foresee that there will be a big issue in dealing with the global mass trauma. I mean, we have a war and we have 2000 people coming back, back with the post-traumatic uh, stress syndrome, but here will be billions of people with that kind of trauma and how we are going to deal with them. So I think this is going to be, uh, uh, going to be a big issue, how people deal with this. But I think uh, not all is uh, bad as uh, Dr. Saab said. So let's not really get caught into, it's not just a vaccine uh, war, it's not that, uh, that, that four countries, of, or including Russia, are shooting at each other who should be the first and whose vaccine is more effective. We have talked today a much, much 
much more deeper reasons behind it and what this uh, does to us. So with this, thank you very much. As Rana Sahib said, it is kind of our, has become our tradition that after the formal session is ended, we stay on line for half an hour or as long as you guys want uh, for informal talk because there is nothing better than an informal talk as, uh, as you all know, because then we can, and I know Dr. Ishtiak is dying to speak, say something in Punjabi because he always says when the session ends, he wants to say something in Punjabi. So it's now free for all. Please talk to each other, introduce yourself uh, to each other, uh, make appointments, uh, express your point of view, ask informal questions. So it's an open floor now. And thank you very much. Thank you to all the participants. And in particular, Kesar, thank you. I'm now saying Kesar without Bhai or without Saab or without Dr. Saab. Thank you very much. It was very insightful, very illuminating and very useful for all of us. Thanks. And th my, thank you from me to all of you at OPP and to all the participants. Uh, thank you for the great discussion.